hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's your host, internationally recognized comedy soundcast soundcaster, Mark... Hersha. Mark. Hersha. Mark. Hersha. Hello, listener. If you're no stranger to this feed, welcome back. If this is all new to you, glad to have you auditing the show. This is Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast, and I'm Mark Hersha, your host for episode 299, which I'm calling Martin Olson Goes to Hell. I'll tell you why in a moment. First, let me ask if you checked out last week's show, Epi 298 entitled Two Hobbits, Two Pals, and a Bee, with my kick-ass worldly co-host Tyson Saner. He featured a triad of soundcast clips from the likes of The Friendship Onion, The Deep Dive with Jessica St. Clair and June Diane Raphael, and Full Release with Samantha B. You can still tap into the magic at our home site, SuckatashShow.com, or through any number of soundcast distribution points on the web, including Apple and Google Podcasts, where you can also rate and review us, Stitcher, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audible.com, and a whole lot more. So, back to the title of this show, Why Does Martin Olson Go to Hell? Martin's a longtime writer of comedy and television and assorted other bits and pieces of fun and frolic, but I wanted to get him on to talk about the latest and second installment in his trilogy, The Encyclopedia of Hell. The new book is The Encyclopedia of Hell, Volume 2, The Conquest of Heaven. The first volume, uh, subtitled An Invasion Manual for Demons, they're, they're both available, yes, Love those titles, love those books. They're funny, they're crammed with humor and incredible weirdness. It's basically a set of instructions from Satan to his demons on how to take over everything. The second book came out recently, and as you'll hear, Martin and I have known each other in a kind of peripheral way for years through our mutual network of comedian friends. So I zoomed him up for a chat, and we get into some of his background and a whole wonderful download about how the Encyclopedia of Hell came to be and a peek into the third volume, which is still making its way out of Martin's head. You can find both of those books up on Amazon and links to them on our SuckatashShow.com home site. Sponsoring this week, as usual, is Henderson's Pants, who are reintroducing, just in time for spring break, their Wake Island abbreviated trousers. I'll jump into my convo with Martin Olson right after this unimportant message. Friends, summer is just around the corner, so you might be thinking to yourself, gosh, it's time to get out the suntan lotion, rubber thongs, and good old Bermuda shorts. Stop right there, Pilgrim. Did you know that every time you slip on a pair of their shorts, the British Protectorate of Bermuda receives a two-cent royalty? That's right, which is why Henderson's Pants, a loyal and legal corporate entity of these United States since 1896, is introducing their Wake Island abbreviated trousers. Roomy and comfortable like the Bermuda shorts you've come to love, but with the freedom that comes from knowing you won't be helping out the subjects of our former British oppressors. The stylish Wake Island abbreviated trousers are named for the unincorporated tiny landmass in the North Pacific, which is a legal U.S. protectorate. Now, when those hot, sticky days of summer hit, slip on a pair of Henderson's Wake Island abbreviated trousers and go for a stroll on the beach, around the pool, or through the mall. Feel free to wear briefs, boxers, or nothing at all under your new snazzy and 100% American abbreviated trousers, because as a U.S. citizen, you have the right to stow your junk any way you choose. Originally designed for the U.S. Department of Immigration, Trout Farmers, and Dark CD Theaters, that's Henderson's Wake Island abbreviated trousers, available wherever things you put your legs into are sold. And now back to more of Suckatash. Uh, joining us is Martin Olson from Los Angeles, California. Somewhere in Los Angeles. Where are you, Martin? I'm in Winnetka, which is in the valley. Oh, Winnetka. Okay, very good. And we are on Zoom, just so people know we're not actually in the same room together. So if you have any sort of inconsistencies, that's probably... Either that or the liquor we're drinking. I can't ever figure oh, out. Oh, yeah. 
how that goes. And mine is this here, which is uh, Guinness. Nice, nice. I just ran out, but that's okay. I love uh, the. You know, what I love about the Guinness cans is it's got that little nitrogen capsule oh in there. God. So when you open it, it releases the nitrogen gas into the beer. Dude, I will only buy these now. It's so fucking beautiful. Uh, the reason that uh, that Martin is joining us is Martin does not have a sound cast, but um, Martin and I uh, go way back sort of informally, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, we yeah. sort of, we've, we have lots of friends of uh, in common. Uh, yeah, yeah you the and, whole uh, San Francisco scene, for example. Yeah, I was trying to think back. When's the first time I actually kind of talked to you? And I, I think it was at a party that Mike Farrow had at his house. Yeah, and that beautiful place he had at a dead end. Yes. And he had a bunch of the, some of the best comedians there, the, you know, the real solid people who were major road pros. Yes, you know? yes. And uh, for those uh, who don't know the name Mike Farrow, uh, you might have known him better as Tommy Sledge which was his stage persona. Uh, One of the funniest acts. Oh, great hard-boiled act, uh, hard-boiled detective as a comedian. It was fantastic. And plus a fine musician too. Oh, really? No, I did not know that side of him. He started off when I first saw him in Boston. He was on the road because he's such a classic road comic and he swung through Boston and his he had a guitar act. Really funny, funny short bits. It looks like he's going to do a long song. It slides into kind of a parody or some original, I think it was made mainly original gags. And then he would stop. And the timing <laughs> was so perfect. He just was really, re and really good guitarist. Oh, wow. And a, and a really straight sounding, good, good voice. So his sense of humor, as you know, is so totally fucking crazy. Yeah. Way out there. So then his straight mannerisms juxtaposed with the material and he was so, he killed. Because I the only the only music that I remember him doing was playing the penny whistle because he, he, he well he had this gimmick where he figured he could get hired uh, by getting himself into into shows as both the opener and the middle act. <laughs> so he, he would come out as Mike Farrow and open the show and, and he'd tell some jokes and he'd play this stupid little penny whistle that he'd pull out of his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and then sing like some kind of Irish song or something. And then he'd say, uh, please welcome your opening act, Mike Farrell. And he'd go off stage and then he'd come back out and the whole Tommy Sledge trench <laughs> coat. And put, put I never again. heard that. That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah you know so. any other? Oh, Tony, uh, Andy Kaufman did it, of course. Yes. In a celebrated way. Do you know any other people that did that? That, that came out twice? Yeah, uh, <laughs> under different like personas. Um, Kaufman, of course. Um, yeah, I can't think of anyone who did it on a regular basis. So it was pretty inventive. I mean, it was he could you know get hired in places that didn't want to pay a lot of money because they would. Emo ever do that? Because Emo's act was different before. Uh, that's true. Uh, he may have. I I only remember him as Weird Emo. So with the with the trombone, a he long a suit time on, ago. Suit on with a trombone. He'd never play it. <laughs> <laughs> never refer to it. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, that's fantastic. So, so Martin, did you ever do time on stage or have you always just been writing? Well, me and two buddies started the first comedy club in Boston. There weren't any clubs. No kidding. And there was just, there were, there were um, gong shows. <clears throat> so okay. I've gone up to Bruce Smirnoff who hosted one of them, a New York comic. And yeah, I know Bruce. Tried to sell him some material and, he said, dude, I can't do this. This is too weird. I don't get it. <laughs> and he actually explained how, what I should be doing to try to sell jokes. Hmm. He helped me out a lot. I was doing music with my partner, Jeff Root, out of college. Then we did four albums at, at home in our home studio. And, and they came out really good. We had some success. And then we started doing comedy records and stuff like that. And comedy films, little Super 8 films. So I looked wanted to somehow you know get a job as a comedy writer because of because of the dick van dyke show since i'm a kid plus i'd seen on tv when i was a kid i saw brother theodore mm. on the merv griffin show and andy kaufman on the dick van dyke summer show 
Okay. I saw both of them with my mom and they both were surrealists and they both were doing this stuff that just bloomed. I said, you mean you can do that? <laughs> you can write that? I really, and then, so that's was my goal since I was a kid was to be a comedy writer, to write stuff like that. After my music partner and I started doing comedy stuff, just on our own, no audience, no performances. I saw in the paper that there was going to be, going to be a comedy class at some college in Boston. So I went in, it was being taught by Sean Morey, who was a street performer at the time and uh, was a super good teacher. And I met two other guys there. There were maybe, you know, 15 people in the class. And it was really good. And it was geared towards that you had to do a performance at the end. Mm. So I met two other guys because I wanted to do a theater. I'd already researched in Harvard Square, this church that had a good stage and um, wanted to do a comedy theater with sketches. And they, want, they, had already lay, they already had this place ready to go, which would be a comedy club. Okay. And they wanted to call it the uh, Comedy Connection. So I'm a, pian- I'm a musician. I play piano. So they said, why don't you play piano for us and, you know, help us start the club. He's, they said, because you want to do sketches and so on. So we started the first comedy club in Boston. It was like a super success. Wow. That's fantastic. And, and that was the comedy. Con- that was the comedy connection. Yeah. And then Barry Crimmins came out of town a year later. Oh, the, so there were lives around the corner. It was un- we just sort of hit it at the right time. It was and what year was crazy. this? 1977, 78. Okay. Then Barry Crimmins came into town from New York and soon followed two other people from Skinny Atlas, his town in upstate New York, which was Bob Goldthwaite and Tom Kenny. <laughs> right. So Barry started the Ding Ho in Cambridge, the second comedy club in Boston. Which was a Chinese restaurant, right? Had you ever been there? No, I've... <laughs> I've had several other uh, people ha- that have Boston comedy in their blood who uh, remember doing uh, open mics at the Ding Ho. That's where I first saw Mike Barrow. Oh, really? Yeah. Funny. So, so Barry said, why don't you just come? Why don't you? So I went over there just to investigate. <clears throat> and Barry said, uh, why don't you just play piano here? Play at both places. I said, I don't need any money. I was, I was working as a tech writer during the day. Okay. But he paid me anyway, because he's <laughs> Barry Crimmins. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the greats. So then I met Lenny Clark, and Lenny had the Wednesday night open mic night there. And um, I was writing material, submitting material for him, and we, and we got, got along good. And then I was writing for other people, <clears throat> and I wrote for Sean Morey's show, the guy who taught us the comedy class. Oh, wow. And I played piano for their shows. And that, so then I just got to know everybody. And started just submitting material. And this other guy named Jim Harris came in and he said, Hey, look at there's a UHF station and a friend of mine works there. And they're looking for some kind of comedy thing, like uh, those monster movie hosted by people. Oh, yeah. I said, You're fucking kidding me. That would be a riot. <laughs> so we, I went in with Jim Harris and with Lenny Clark as the host. I don't know if you've met Lenny Clark. He was, he was the biggest, uh, he was the funniest, like, lounge comic he was the funniest saloon comic you certainly know lenny from his work i i don't think we've ever crossed paths but he could handle any crowd he would he would we would just watch him because he would purposely work the crowd into a frenzy and then he'd turn on them (laughs) just for the pleasure of then winning them back even more hugely (laughs) that was his mo that was the shape of his oh that's funny that's so Lenny funny. was the host of the Lenny Clark Late Show on UHF TV in Boston, which was the uh, Red Sox station. Oh, okay. Sports station. So we did that for two years and I got a bunch of tapes and it was pretty funny. I mean, it was ultimately we got thrown off because we did such bad taste sketches. <laughs> the guy called us into his office, me and Lenny, and said, look, this, that's it. And, you know, we did like the the, the mentally challenged faith healer. <laughs> and that was Bob Goldthwaite. Nice. <laughs> that was Bobcat Goldthwaite to, to people at home. Yes. And uh, we did the Negro News with Jimmy <laughs> Smith. And um, so the guy didn't dig it. So we uh, got fired. But I took the tapes out 
Don Gavin said, I'm going to cross country. We're going to cross country, go on the road for the first time. Why don't you come with me? Don Gavin's one of the funniest people in the world. I know Don. He, he did a little bit of time in San Francisco. Yeah, I was there with him. Okay. He and I would travel across. He and I traveled across the country. We had no idea what we we're doing. We didn't have any money. Barry Crimmins would send us $200 and <laughs> wire us $200 at a time. Really? This is before the internet. But Don's a gambler and he has the heart and soul of a con man. He knows how to make money playing poker. Oh, wow. And he had a book. Pre-internet, you had to use books to find things. And he found all of the card parlors. Mm. And so we, we arranged our route to be where the card parlors were. <laughs> most guys go to where the comedy clubs are but you guys yeah interesting so we did all those clubs i mean and i met everybody through just being don's valet you know <laughs> and his writer but really it wasn't writing for him he just was the funniest person in the world and a good friend it still is so finally we ended up in san francisco by luck on the eve of the 1980 comedy competition oh okay that's that's about the, when I, I was getting involved in so same, same time were you there i was i was the very first official timer and scorekeeper for the comedy competition get out starting in 1980 get out yeah. <laughs> yes for a long time they had a guy who was a uh, an accountant who did the the timing and scorekeeping so it would look very official like price waterhouse but before he came in for the first three years i was the official timer and scorekeeper <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> was that the foxes they brought in yes afterwards? john and john and ann yeah absolutely <clears throat> so um uh there i because as you know every night just to tell people it was a every night it was a different venue and initially it was 20 comics five minutes each and the first night we went to Petaluma, I think, or someplace. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, we went in and Don performed that night when we just we just were on the last night when they were going to be picking people. Yeah, the auditions. And luckily he had the mystique factor going because you know when someone in Boston would come in from New York. Yeah. And they, they would talk themselves up and they'd be funny. And so we, you know, they, Bill and Paul, who started the club, the comedy connection they would book them and then later we'd find because that they were just an opener <laughs> and then they would be closing you know oh boy but every single time they that when that happened they rose rose to the occasion oh cool yeah because they had a mystique factor yeah it's some psychic group mind thing that happens when they're introduced in a certain way and the people who are in charge are really looking forward to this guy and talking him up, then that person's good. Yeah, it does start something that's interesting. Particularly, there was a, there was always a connection between Boston and San Francisco oh, in yeah. terms of, I mean, you talk about <clears throat> Goldthwait and Kenny and yeah. Dan Spencer and, and, yeah. and Ger all these guys uh, yeah, would man. come in. And yeah, there was definitely a vibe that the San Francisco audience dug. It was kind of like they couldn't really, I don't think they liked the, the kind of harder edge New York comics as much as they yeah, did. The, there was a thing about the Boston attitude. Although Steve Pearl was one of the biggest comics. Oh yeah. And it just was machine gunning jokes. So that wasn't totally true. But then again, Steve was, was a, had a, had a surreal mind. Yes. Even yeah. though they were jokes. Yeah. And Slayton, I mean, Slayton was pure New York. Slayton. <laughs> Bobby Slayton was pure New York, but uh, there was something about him that became, became beloved. <laughs> <laughs> I got a story for you with Slayton. And then I'll continue what happened in, in yeah. San Francisco because it was a good story. Um, so I'm working at Disney and we, because I ended up being a writer like you. <laughs> <laughs> we both did well. And so I'm at Disney for many years and uh, the shows we did were successful. And I saw Slayton down on the Disney lot. Mm. I said, Bobby, it's Martin Olson. You remember me? He says, oh yeah, Marty, I met you with Bob Ruby. Because I had directed a bunch of comedians shows for the HBO space and everything. Oh, okay. So I said, Hey, could you come up and help do a prank with me? Because this guy, we just started the show and the guy who created the show is a huge Slayton fan. He used to, you know, listen to you all the time. <clears throat> so uh, I said, just come up there. We'll figure it out as we're walking up. 
So I put him in a in an office with a with a Cintiq and with a I mean this was before Cintiqs even, but with the drawing board and put a hat on him. And uh, I said, all right, I'm going to bring this guy in, guy in to introduce him to the new board guy. <laughs> and he's a huge Slayton fan, so I just want you to start fucking jabbering. Just keep talking. Don't even let him start asking questions. Just want him to be astonished. And so I brought him in. I said, hey, oh, by the way, there's a new guy. I'll introduce you. I was talking to him over at the, at the you know, to get a Coke. <clears throat> so I brought um, the creator of the show in. And, uh, and so Bobby just starts going. He was super fucking funny. He just started r- rambling on about Disney and about how much he hated it here. <laughs> and how it, it sucks so bad. <laughs> it was a big fucking worldwide octopus. <laughs> And he, and the guy, it was so funny seeing his face, Mark, because he literally couldn't, he had a cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Here's his favorite comedian in a different context, <laughs> sitting at the fucking board. What is going on? And then he howled because he realized it was just a prank on him. Uh. And he couldn't catch his breath and he just was bent over laughing. That's how fucking funny Slayton is on the fly. Oh yeah, no Slayton's great, but uh, let's get back to your uh, your worldwide journey. <laughs> well, the trip to uh, with Don Gavin to San Francisco by chance changed my life. It made my whole career because it was all my career has been entirely luck. <clears throat> I mean, I had to know how to write and try to learn how to do it, but it was believe me, it was all luck. But you'll hear for yourself. <laughs> I go to Petaluma the first night. It's going to be a week of nights at different venues. 20 comedians, everybody five minutes. Third comedian was this guy. He goes on and he has no setup. He has no transitions. He's a short guy. He dresses. He's like an Italian short guy. He dresses like out of 1800s fucking Vienna with a cane and a fucking scarf and a pea coat. What the fuck? And a vest and a tie and everything. It was Jeremy Crane. Oh, Dr- Jeremy, yes. And I was fucking a howling because oh. it was the ballsiest shit. And he didn't care if anybody laughed. No. <laughs> so I yeah, said so this, and inside my mind and my heart, I said, I swear I'm going to be working with this guy. I don't know who he is. And we ended up, he, he ended up my writing partner on Comic Strip Live for, for three years with, head writers for it that's amazing he and i were head writers for the fucking sag awards for four years no way and uh also we were head writers for the biggest for the biggest budgeted up until that time animated show at film roman really it was twisted tales of felix the cat so jeremy and i became writing partners and it just was a that was a huge thing how is jeremy you talk to him I, uh, we text each other once in a while. I think it was his birthday a couple of days ago. Yeah, it was his birthday. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I wished him happy birthday. Have you seen him much? I haven't seen him in years. I occasionally yeah. will kind of run across him in like Facebook, but I don't think he's on there very often. But he'll just, uh, you know, Jeremy, he'll just text me out of the blue after I heard, haven't heard from him for a year. <clears throat> he doesn't answer me back or he doesn't answer the phones or whatever. It, his health is better now, I hope. Oh, good. I think it's much better because he did have the heart problem and the surgeries. But he'll text me like a, after a year of silence and say, so some guy just threw this tra- three trash bags on my front yard and I open all three of them. You know, he'll go into this fucking story without any setup, just like his act. <laughs> <laughs> and also he sends me some of the stuff he's been working on. He's still writing. Uh, and his subject matter is always so bizarre and interesting and historical, you know. I remember him coming out to do a show in the punchline dressed in a full bunny suit from head to toe. <laughs> and, and did you marry and, the and, rabbit boy? And, and, yes, and but singing People Are Strange by Echo and the Bunnymen to open his show. <laughs> <laughs> he was my favorite, I'm telling you. So the first time I saw him, so that, that trip with Don... I found my writing partner and get this. We had to each stay with someone. I stayed with, I stayed with, uh, because I stayed with, um, with uh, Kevin Meany. Okay. 
And so for payment for him, I wrote a bit and I ended up being smart and writing a bit in his style. Nice. And I put, put it on his refrigerator and, and he used it for years. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Mayberry LSD. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so Meany and I ended up being writing partners. He, he calls me up one day. He says, hey, I just got a series from Comedy Central in London. Do you want to be head writer? So, because I'd always be submitting him stuff. Yeah. And so I said, yeah, thanks. So I had went in for, to meet with the people. And then the next thing we're flying over to London and we won a, the best variety show award the, in London. What was the show? London Underground. Huh. We took it over from, from my old buddy from Boston, uh, Dennis Leary. Okay. He was hosting it over there. Was that in the Mayfair? in London and it was really anyways that was so Kevin and I became friends for life god bless him I miss him every day yeah he was a great one and also Kevin had learned everything from Jeremy mm. he learned number one not to ever care if they laugh <laughs> <laughs> thus meaning is I don't care yes you know yes. classic song <clears throat> so the third thing oh so i ended up staying with meanie don ended up staying with mike and mary joe pritchard okay and mike and mary joe pritchard and i get along really got along really good too and mary joe was writing at the time she was writing all this shit and was such a good fucking writer especially with dialogue so she and i ended up being writing partners for 30 years how many writing partners do you have well <laughs> i have usually as you know when you're on a job you you get assigned writing partners yeah <clears throat> but mary joe and jeremy were my main writing partners for sure at disney it was dan povenmire and swampy marsh who created uh Phineas and ferb and some other shows so you know Mike Pritchard won the 1980 comedy competition. He was a force of nature. Oh my God. He was the funniest. I, we heard, I said, who's going to win? Every single person said Mike Pritchard. And every person also said, well, he doesn't have an act. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to win. But he's the funniest for what he said. What do you mean? He doesn't have an act. Cause you can't, how do you know, unless you see him? Yes. And so then uh, I had a nemesis. I had an enemy at the, and this is the, what, third, fourth part of changing my life by going to this fucking thing. <laughs> I had an enemy for Monica Piper or May Lee Davis. Yes. She was in the competition. And I so, how, so, how, so how was she? Or I, I must know because she and I are good friends for years. Oh, no, not Monica. No, who's, who could not like her? She's the, exactly. sweetest, she's the funniest. She comes from comedy, uh, a legacy comedy thing with her dad. Yeah. He was the, one of the vaudeville. He's like, she's, she has funniness in her bones. Oh yeah. Plus she's fucking beautiful and so sweet. We wrote a pilot together. She and did I. You? Yeah, we did. It never went anywhere, but we still oh, talk. That's it. right. I think I read it. The blue cutlass. Yeah. I read that. That was great, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's so funny. In fact, I think, didn't I meet you down there too? I, you must have. You yeah. Must have. It's, it's so funny. I think I met you at different weird places. Because I think we were at a dinner and uh, with uh, Mary Jo and Jeremy in San Rafael, I think. Yeah. There was a dinner at a restaurant in San Rafael. And I think Dick Bright was there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good memory. <laughs> you just brought me back. So we have a bunch of connections, obviously, through the years. <laughs> but the last thing was my enemy. So... Monica flew up a writer from, from LA and she was uh, to, to coach her and to help her with the jokes and with the act because you really needed somebody. Because every time that you did the next phase, there were three phases. <clears throat> First it was five minutes and it was fucking 20 minutes. No, it was 10 no, no, minutes. 10 minutes for 10 to 12 minutes for the semis and then yeah. 15 to 20 for the, for the uh, finals. Exactly. Yeah. So you really needed somebody because how fucking hard is it when you have to stretch the act 
you know, remember what the, what are you going to close with? What's, I mean, we usually know what you're going to close with, but how do you get there? Yeah. So and the funny thing about the Bay area is that you play in six different cities yeah. around the area. And every one of them has its own weird sort yes. of au audience personality. You know what? It was the greatest. I thought it was the, I, I'm unfamiliar with other comedy competitions, although I should know the Boston ones, but I never went to them. I thought it was the most amazing grad course for a comedian ever because of what you just said. Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely this weird pot boiler of a uh, experience. And some people that just sucked at the competition did great in their careers. Yeah, isn't that people weird? That, yeah, I mean, like um, Rosie O'Donnell. Oh, she's the sweetest person in the world. She yeah. was so fucking nice and so fucking funny and, and, and charming and perky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there were all sorts of people that just didn't, couldn't get that vibe of, yeah. switching it up for where they were and yeah you had to switch it up dude yeah you had to be flexible and you had to think on your feet even more than normally because the whole idea of being a comedian is thinking on your feet you know how do you deal with the fucking crowd exactly and then you've got these judges that were pulled from like oh the, lo the local papers <laughs> right? right they were like the reviewers okay. and like a club owner and these different people and yeah. they would, if you made it into the semis, they were they were the judges when you went back to that town. So not only did you have to That's right. add more time to your act, but you had to go, are they going to ding me for doing material I did last time? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it just was amazing. I mean, I was, I mean, I didn't know uh, John and Ann to, that well, but I mean, they were always both nice to me, but <clears throat> and it, you have to be a little sleazy to be a club owner. <laughs> But I liked them both, and I thought that their setup was excellent. Yeah. You know, it was really good. I was mainly because I was, after I stayed with Meany, then I stayed with the Pritchards because Don went back. Oh, yeah, because I because I had to go see my enemy. Yes, yes. Let's, my enemy let, let's hear about your LA. nemesis here. I want to know about this. So it was this woman, and she was like, you know, just a you know, beautiful girl. Never didn't talk much, though, but it just was so mysterious. And we were like in our early 20s, right? Yeah. So f finally, Maana came in fourth. She just missed in the scoring because you had to get the top three to get the money. Yeah. So uh, this woman, this she her name was Kay and Monica had, had flown her up. Or I mean, May Lee at the time, her name yes. was. And um, so we got along. We were laughing because it was funny to have an enemy. <laughs> who was pretty and mysterious and nice, you know, and was a fucking comedy writer. <laughs> and why was she an enemy? What what made her a nemesis? Because I wanted Don to win. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys were like the seconds in a duel. Yes, totally. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm cheering for a different team than her. <laughs> so then she said, well, if you're in, I, I said, where do you live? And she said, I live on the canals. I live in the last shack in Venice, uh, I said, Venice, what's that? She said, is it old? Used to be a town with a goddamn amusement park in it where the owner, Al Albert Kinney, I think his name was, he, he owned all the land and he turned it into a canals to look like Venice, mm, Italy, yes, yeah. which is why they called it Venice. I said, what? She said, yeah, you come, I would come down and stop in. Here's my address. So I stopped in and I just never left. Really? So she and I got married. We adopted two kids. <laughs> no kidding. So all the comedians, the wedding was up in San Francisco and all the Boston comedians flew out for it. It just was really the sweetest fucking That's thing. That's fantastic. So, lucky. so that was why that whole trip changed my life. Wow. Amazing. Well, I want to find out more about your um, TV writing and all of that, but I do want to make sure we talk about your book. That's just out. So it's happy the, about it. Yeah, it's uh, the second in a series. I don't know if there's going to be more. Yeah, there's these one thi more. I these things seem a trilogy. These things seem hellacious to write because they are incredibly densely packed with <laughs> text. Uh, this is uh, the second book is the Conquest of Heaven. It is the follow up to the Encyclopedia of Hell. In fact, the Encyclopedia of Hell, uh, Volume Two. Yes, and uh, <laughs> there are advertisements of some sort in here there's how to invade heaven the basics there's <laughs> the, 
Lord Satan and the quest for the secret of his origin. Yeah. And it's written in just this fantastic style. The fonts are, are all different from page to page. There's amazing illustrations. Yeah. I mean, this book is an incredible, incredible work. And well, I'm thanks, taking man. I'm taking my time to go through it because it seems like one of those books that if you like try to skim it, you're going to miss pretty much everything. Well, you know what? I would suggest because who, who likes to read fucking books? <laughs> go to the middle at, uh, on the... the uh, god's gun the story of god's gun okay and just read through the to the to the end okay so that just, I, just i read disregard. that recently i i was saying is this the book any good because you never know if what you do is good you never know <clears throat> and so i'm reading it and i'm fucking howling laughing and i'm crying <laughs> so so i know that from god's gun to the end is really good it really okay and the, the rest i don't have to worry about okay i don't have to worry about I mean, maybe the other part's good too. I don't know, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, but I don't. But it could be horrible. <clears throat> but, but I know uh, that the second half is great. It is an amazing work, as as it was the first. The first was uh, incredible, and I have that as well. I don't you have do. it. I do, of course. Thanks, Mark. That's nice of you, man. Of course. Uh, so the yeah. first book is Encyclopedia of Hell. Just to talk about it for a minute. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to. to yeah, talk. yeah. Let's let's get into it. <laughs> the first book is Encyclopedia of Hell, and it's excuse me uh it's where um uh, pardon my i'm drinking this guinness i have to <laughs> open my second one <laughs> pardon my belching um no, I'll, uh, cut all one, uh, I'll cut all i'll cut all that out <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know you the interview would be 15 minutes but i'll cut all that out <laughs> the first book is where uh where hell is overcrowded so satan invades earth i'm going to use humans as foodstuffs <laughs> and that's his plan that's what they do they eat the humans and then the book is over <laughs> so the interesting thing is that demons were kind of afraid and leery about humanity and satan didn't want them to fuck up the invasion and so he wrote an encyclopedia a uh, to z because satan can, is, is the, created all of hell and all demons out of the substance of his mind mm. Book two explains the origin of Satan, but Satan wrote an encyclopedia, A to Z, about everything on earth. And that's the encyclopedia of hell. Right. Which is an invasion manual of earth. <laughs> so that's the story of the first one. And I lucked out and Warner Brothers optioned it for, for a, a film. Oh, so that book made so much dough. I just was, I mean, nobody would publish it. So, so how, how did you finally get it published? It's just a long, <laughs> it's not even believable. So 18 book agents rejected it. Wow. Said satire doesn't sell. And I was, I'm more, I'm, I'm a day, I, I work for writing for a living. So I'm writing every day at an office. <clears throat> so I did this at night. But it's after I lucked out and I sold a feature to, to DreamWorks. So then I had money I could take a year off. Oh, nice. So I always wanted to do this book because I wanted to do the craziest book ever written. That was my goal. <laughs> I, think I mean, you, you can't think possibly you, do that. I think you I wanted, succeeded. I wanted it to be the funniest book. I wanted every page to be funny, which it isn't. Because it's just, it's 2000 jokes, basically. It's just a joke book with a story attached. A <laughs> joke book with a life support system <laughs> a, a cosmic one <laughs> and so uh it, the i got a call from so 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 i played piano for the steve allen theater for the tomorrow show with ron lynch for 15 oh, yeah. years in la he's one of my oldest friends he was one of the original com comedians at the comedy connection oh okay i love ron He's one of he's the the funniest guy. So he uh, so I played piano for fifteen years. Now he the, the place got torn down, and we're outside uh, after the show because it's a midnight goddamn show, and I'm out with Amit Idelman, the guy that created the that produced the whole thing. And this actor friend came up, this really nice guy, funny funny actor. He says, "Hey Martin, I just read your book." The hell book and this is before it's published right i couldn't get it published it was rejected by everybody but 18 publishers and you know so all these 
book agents. So I said, how did you get it? He says, I, I worked for a production company and Warner Brothers sent the actual manuscript, 400 pages out to all these production companies to see who wants to bid on it or buy really? it. Really? Wow. And so, and he really liked it. And so he just was really, was cool. And so a meet standing there who runs the theater, who's a super genius. And he says, Martin, I didn't know you wrote a book. I said, yeah, but I couldn't sell it. You know, it's a done deal, but I, I sold the film rights. I lucked out, but nobody would publish it because it got shelved. Because it came out at the same, I had three different directors and these two genius, screen, hilarious screenwriters. But it came out right when Constantine, oh, came out, okay. which was a demon hunter thing. And yep. so they shelved it. So, so he says, so I tell him the story, a meet. And it's like three, two in the morning and there's moonlight coming down. We're outside of the patio and it was a weird, weird vibe. And he stopped and he kind of froze. He's looking up and he says, would you do me a favor? I said, what are you talking about? He says, of course, what do you want? He says, tonight, do you have a copy of the book? Because it just was at the beginning of the internet where you can attach things. Yeah. I said, yeah, I have a mock-up with the fake illustrations and everything. He says, could you tonight send that out to Adam Parfrey at Feral House Books? I said, dude, I know Feral House Books. I'm the, their biggest fan. It used to be a mock books and they don't do any fiction. It's all non, it's, it's books like how to, how to murder people. It's the craziest <laughs> fucking publisher ever. They publish things other people won't publish. He said, exactly. <laughs> Plus, I'm not going to send out the, attach the book to, you never do that. That's death because you have to send a query first. Yeah. He says, would you do me a favor and just do it and tell him in the email that I told you to. <laughs> I said, what, what's the, he said, I had a flash. <laughs> he had some kind of psychic flash. Later on, he told me after the book got published, because two, two weeks later, Adam Harfrey at Farrell House writes me an email and it was a prank. He writes me and he says, Dear Martin, I received Encyclopedia of Hell. We do not publish any fiction, <laughs> screenplays, poems. Uh, and, and he said a couple other things. Then there was a big space in the email. You had to scroll down. And he says, but I would be delighted to publish your book. I've been reading it for days and howling, laughing. Oh, my gosh. So I just couldn't believe it. I showed my wife. I said, what the hell? And it became a hit, you know? That's amazing. So that was just pure luck that that actor had friend happened to come up at that time and say that that Amit had a flash what the fuck was that yeah because I never would have sent it to them that's why and, and I pitched the three books the trilogy so the second book the one that I'm hawking now conquest of heaven is after all humans are eaten and hell is expanded to include earth we find out that hell earth and heaven are the same orb through immensely different time frames. Mm. Satan doesn't know this, but hell is way in the past, and demons have evolved into humans, and humans evolve into angels. Interesting. So Satan finds out for the first time because he doesn't remember in the second book his origin. So he hears the legends and the stuff on Earth about God, the Creator. And says, if, if he exists, I, he wants to kill him and take over the whole thing. That's his job. So that's the second book. He, it's about the invasion of heaven by the demons. It's the craziest thing I ever wrote. I just was so happy. And so uh, I was very pleased reading it a, a couple of years later, just recently, and really, you know, laughing and crying, reading from, the, from that first, about the middle to the end. <laughs> And so the third book is um, at the end of the second book, they the demons fuck up and they um, destroy heaven. They destroy the universe and has to be fixed. Oops. And Satan gets pushed into the time void. Um, by the, and he finds out he confronts the creator, who's this woman, this girl, little girl <laughs> who loves him and, and finds out why he got created and what was happening. Because god was insane the whole all of heaven was an insane asylum uh -huh. and god had so many trillions of beings because he had also created satan who 
in a fractally kind of a way created all of the demons in hell from his mind. Wow. All right. So in a nutshell, the third book is Satan gets pushed because they use they use the time twister bomb, which Satan had just had as a a, a, a mad device, a mutual destruction thing, never to be mm. used. But the idiot, Satan went off on a solo mission to find and kill God <laughs> using his herkaba and his instincts of, because he's, he was there. Hell is all out of his mind. So he finds out that God, God planned the whole thing. God planned entire the whole thing because God was insane and knew that he couldn't be cured because all, all of heaven was basically this magnificent palace and place of, of an insane asylum. There's one patient, which is him. <laughs> and the angels were the doctors and stuff trying to cure him. Okay. Wow. And a, a lot of fucked up things happen, but uh, it, finally the creator confronts Satan, but through a hologram because she too was, was too embarrassed about what she had done to her son. Mm. And uh, she, it turns out because she was in, insane, she just wanted to kill herself. So the cure was that she had to take the part of herself that wanted to kill herself out mm. and put it in a fucking black hole or someplace where it just couldn't. And that became hell. Interesting. Wow. So at any rate, uh, it was a very emotional thing because it's about a mother and a child. And so ultimately God retires and just gives the key to the universe and everything to her son. It's all yours now. But then the demons, meanwhile, have been <laughs> planning this invasion, thinking Satan fucked up or whatever, because he doesn't care about them. And they bring the time twister. Bomb. <laughs> and meanwhile, they time travel because they're all time travelers, by the way, because hell is way in the past, yeah. earth is in the present, and heaven's way in the future. <laughs> and so they um, had to, they had to, um, uh, uh, the, the demons had to uh, attack huge force forces and <laughs> and they're 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 uh, uh, allergic to beauty ah so when they get there they have all these they can't listen to them because it's just all this beautiful even the plants and everything are just getting exuding beautiful <laughs> chords and music like it's the celestines just, yeah <clears throat> and uh the whole place is glowing it's just fucking beautiful and this it smells beautiful and it just looks beautiful so they have to wear these eye shades thing because uh, it just turns up that they end up all the forces, they, as the closer they march, because they had to park their time vehicles in the tundra, <laughs> in the forest, and then march into the city and ram through the walls. But they just were shitting and puking all the way because of, they literally, I mean, they were couldn't stand the beauty and they would get closer and closer to it because yeah. they had these filters. They, they all work with enchantments. So it's just a crazy, crazy story of that. They finally get in, they... And the whole place is just fucking trash. Really? They break through the oh. gates. And God's insane. And God forgot, didn't construct heaven correctly because he's so, so fucking nuts. <laughs> Nothing decomposes. Oh. So every single thing is it's just, there's trash up to the, you have to just, they have to clean up. They have to walk. The whole heaven is filled with trash. So finally they go into and Satan goes in to try to confront God and kill him. And then there's the meeting of the mother and son. It just, it's, so it really worked out. The story worked out good for such a crazy, ridiculous story. And the third book is after the time twister bomb goes off because the demons set this off because they're idiots. And they accidentally threw this a uh, little bit of, um, treachery because they all want to take over satan's job they set up the bomb and he ends up being shot into the time void and so the third book is where they the characters i haven't told you about who are the main characters have to go and find satan in the time void and save him and in so doing they find out how something comes from nothing ah uh -huh, okay which is the secret of everything so it's Encyclopedia of Hell 3, The Triumph of Nothingness. Wow, this is amazing, Martin. I mean, it was a really, really fun to write, but it was hard to figure out. <laughs> 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 and, 
Anyways, thanks for helping me promote the book. So if anybody wants to buy the book, yes, it's on Amazon. Amazon. Oh, I've heard of that. <laughs> so excellent. Well, there'll be a, I'll put a link up. We have a blog piece that accompanies the episode. So I'll uh, put a link up there for that. Right. So people can get to that at succotashow.com or just go to Amazon and look up Encyclopedia uh, of Hell. And uh, the second book is Encyclopedia of Hell to the Conquest of Heaven. Yes. Well, gosh, we actually, uh, we probably are about out of time for this this uh, segment, but uh, I would love to have you back to talk more about your uh, your other writing. I mean, you've been writing for, for years in Los Angeles and you've got all sorts of things you've done and I'd love to have you back to talk. Well, that would more. be so much fun. It was so much fun just talking with you. But plus we, we're like kind of like parallel guys. We've both been doing the same thing for years and on the outskirts of the comedy scene, as well as, I mean, yeah. like you, I did an act, you know what I mean? But I just wasn't, it wasn't my thing. I was a writer, you know? Yeah. And I, I was an improviser. I never did stand up, but I've been doing improv yeah. for 35 years. So it's like, always on the periphery and I helped with the comedy competition. I used to run a comedy club up in Seattle. Oh yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. The comedy underground up there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I used to uh, help the Foxes book the punchline and rooster teeth feathers and sunny Vale and right. a bunch of other clubs. But uh, Martin, uh, I'm, I'm very excited even more now that I am. I haven't even gotten to the good part. <laughs> of con the conquest of heaven. I, I was enjoying where I was, but now I feel like I'm driving through Bakersfield on my way to somewhere <laughs> wonderful. Well, needless to say, it was super fun talking with you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, Martin. Thanks so much. And we'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks again to Martin Olson for the chat. A little free form and all over the map, the kind of conversation that happens when you know so many people in common and have so many things in common that you sometimes wander all over the place. We'll have him back and get into some of the TV shows he's written for, where some of the other adventures have taken him, and where his roots are. I know, I know, that's where you're supposed to start interviews, but oh well, I hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. This is episode 299, as I mentioned at the top, which means our next show is our 300th episode. What does that mean? What do we have in store? Well, I just got off of Zoom before recording this, talking with co-host Tyson Saner, and I'll tell you what we thought we'd do right after we rip open the tweet set. Whoa, guess I forgot to check on Tweety for a bit. No matter, here are some of the kind folks that have mentioned our at Succotash show handle in their social media streams during the past couple of weeks. David J. Griffiths, The Jock Doc Podcast, Hunter Block, Tony Rowell, What's the Go Soundcast? Let's Chat Podcast. Stuart Buckland. The D Head Factor. Sensibly Cynical Pod. Maddie Kelly. Chris Kelly. Kelly and Kelly. It, who else? One of those people in the Kelly. Oh, never mind. The Legal Geeks. Misfit Scully. Tolkien Professor. Different Way Games. Blood and Black Rum Soundcast. Code Smart 78. And pause the dinosaur hunter. I shake my head with Lisa and Sam. The salty language soundcast. National treasure hunt. Al Polo. Katie Long. Rick Mealy. Henrik Person. Davian Dent. Samantha Martin. And Aristotle Dreyer. Now, if you want to be tossed into the tweet sack for a mention in this, in this space, just throw our handle at Succotest Show into your socials. All right, so here's the deal for next week's episode 300, celebrating our 11th year of doing this show. At least deal number one is that we will have a special guest join us, and the one we have in mind was also this show's very first in-studio guest way, way, way back at the beginning. But I have to call him still and make sure he's available on short notice. If that bombs out, then Tyson and I will flash back to a few of our favorite clips in the past 11 years of doing this show. Either way, you're getting both hosts for the price of one, so don't forget to join us right here in this feed for Succotash Epi 300. Until next time, if you should happen to be walking down the street and fall headfirst into an open manhole, and the EMTs that rescued you just happen to ask if you were listening to anything fun, 
Won't you please pass the succotash? You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast, with your host, Mark Hershaw. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Suckatash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at marc at SuccotashShow.com. Or call into the Suckatash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. That number again is 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash you slash Suckatash. Suckatash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Suckatash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Suckatash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.